I'm going to go to the Board of Supervisors with an open accounting book and say, this is what we have today. This is what it costs to run the department today. This is what I would like to have. This is what would be better. Now you guys decide what you want for your communities. Do you want more? Do you want the same? Or do you want less? You're going to decide it, though, and then we're all going to go to the media, and we're all going to, in a round table, say, this is what you guys decided with the money. There's not going to be any bickering. There's not going to be any fighting. There's not going to be any finger pointing. There's going to be honesty. There's going to be honesty and openness and integrity. And that's how we have to run a business with your money. We have to save money. We have to show you where we're spending money. And we have to provide you with the best service possible. That's what I'm offering. Did I confuse anyone? <laughs> Any questions I didn't answer? Yes, ma'am. CCWs. CCWs. That is a big hot issue. Does anybody care about CCWs? See, you guys were all afraid and you're waiting for somebody to help and somebody else to answer. I want to tell you something about CCWs. No matter where it is we go, no matter where it is that I talk, the only question that is asked at every single place is about CCWs. Everywhere we go, somebody asks about CCWs. I am 100% very pro for concealed carry permits. I believe that it is our right, Second Amendment right, to have a CCW permit. Or it's our right to own, to keep and bear arms. The state of California has a rule that you cannot carry a gun unless you have a permit. Surprisingly, for the state of California, their process is very, very simple. And they leave the, that whether or not that decision is completely up to the sheriff, 100%. He's either going to let you or he's not. And it's that simple. Currently, you're told that you have to wait two years to even get an appointment to turn in your paperwork. And then you're going to wait four to six months after that to get an answer of whether or not you can exercise your constitutional right. It makes absolutely no sense to me. It's kind of embarrassing to me that we as a department say that, again, we can't help you because we need more money and more people. That's not the answer. Well, inside your house is a different story because you can have a gun inside your house. That's the first part of the Second Amendment, to keep arms. The bear arms is the second part of the amendment that a state can regulate, which they do, and that's where CCW permits come in. So the actual carrying a gun, if you want to carry it like I carry it, or I'm all, I always have a gun, but I'm a cop, so I can. If you have a CCW permit, you can do the same thing. So the two-year wait will be eliminated because I want to eliminate it, because all of you want it gone. After it's eliminated, you will never have to wait that long again. You cannot tell me that Riverside County, I know the people that I work with, I know that we are very capable and that we are very competent. You cannot tell me that Orange County and San Bernardino County have better employees than Riverside County does. Their issuance, per, their, their issuance policy for permits, Orange County, I have friends that work in their unit. The background process takes 30 minutes. 30 minutes to do a background. Then you wait three weeks to six weeks for the paperwork to be returned from DOJ with your fingerprints because that's part of the state law. You have to be fingerprinted, it has to go through the state, and then we have to wait for it to come back. So when those prints come back, the sheet that says you're all clear, they match it up with your interview, that your background check that took 30 minutes, and they call you up and say, come get your permit. I was giving a, a, a talk a couple of weeks ago and a young man was there and he said, he, he told me a story about Orange County. His friend called up Orange County on a Friday and he said, I need to make a, a, an appointment for my CCW permit. And they said, okay, can you be here this afternoon? And he panicked and said, no, you're supposed to make an appointment for a long time in the future. And they said, well, we can do it today. And he said, I can't get there. And they said, okay, we don't work on Monday. It's a holiday. Tuesday. He said, okay, I'll be there. So he showed up on Tuesday. He had already done his class, his, you know, his, his training class and everything else. He showed up on Tuesday. On Friday, he had his CCW permit. Right. And you can't tell me that my deputies in, in Riverside aren't as capable as Orange County. 
or is San Bernardino County? San Bernardino County takes maybe like there be like 30 to, or 30 to 60 days. Orange County is less, three to six weeks. That's all. So we could be the same thing, and I will make it the same thing because I know that that's what the residents want. I'm not saying that every single person in the county has to carry a gun, but what I'm saying is if you want to carry a gun and you're not criminally or mentally prohibited from it, then you should be allowed to carry it in an expeditious manner because my personal opinion is a right delayed is a right denied. So if we're telling you you can't do it for two years, we're denying your right to do it. Yes, sir. Yeah, my question is I'm concerned in San Jacinto. Now, in San Jacinto, um, we have a turnover of officers. I mean, you don't know who's going to show up next. I think we had one good officer, Officer Cyril. He's probably over there with you. He's a head. Yeah. And we, we don't get the protection in the area I think we deserve. Here's, here's my philosophy on patrol and what, where I differ from the current administration. I believe that officers should work in the same place all the time. That's how you gain an expertise. The current policies that we have are roughly every two years you move to something else. Now, I was in narcotics, I worked narcotics. It took me about a year, a year and a half before I figured out what I was doing. If they transferred me out of that six months later, I mean, what good did that do anybody? Because the next person right behind me has absolutely no idea what they're doing now. Their learning curve is going up. So my belief is that officers that work, that spend more time in the same place, you get a better involvement with the community. The community trusts that officer because they see them all the time. You get to know them. And now law enforcement has a personal buy-in with you. If you say, if you know that officer is Joe, and you call him up and say, Joe, I got a problem over here. You need to come help. This is a quality of life issue. There's more of a personal relationship there where there's a vested interest that they're going to take care of your problem rather than a blank face that nobody knows each other and we're just handling your call for service. Okay. I personally went into the San Jacinto Police Department mm -hmm. and expressed my concerns about the officers, officer safety, and the way some of the officers, as you said, came with a bad attitude. And I advise them of certain concern we have of uh, drugs, sex offenders in our neighborhood, in our development. And I was basically told to go home and enjoy my retirement. Now, the reason he said, I'm a former police officer from the city of Compton, and I guarantee you a lot of those officers would not step foot out there. I also work as a deputy in out of Kansas City. So I know the ropes, but the way what I have seen has a bitter taste about it, because we don't know who's going to be the chief the next week. I don't know if there's a detective bureau. I've called up regarding we had narcotic sales going on, and I was told, oh, we're too busy. And we watched the guys sell narcotics for two hours, standing on the corner. Nobody ever showed up. I've seen instances where uh, they sent an officer out on a burglary call. He walked in the front door, shined a flashlight, shined a flashlight, shined, and left. The neighbor whose house, she called me, she was in Philadelphia. She said, there's still somebody in my house. Well, she called back. They sent in two other officers. And I guarantee you, they can document this. They decided, well, maybe we better go in the backyard. They went back there. Her glass window was smashed and they'd already been in and out. And during the time that the officer was in the front of the house, the people were still in the house. Now, I call that a poor quality of police work. I can't speak for that situation, but let me tell you what causes that culture. Currently in our culture, the culture of how we do business in the department is <coughs> in election years and when statistics come out year after year, our measurement of success is response times. So the only thing we care about is response times. So when you call 911, how long does it take for us to get there? So the issue is, how do you lower response times? Because while I'm helping you, there's still a call pending. And I got to get that taken care of because 
that's going to lower that response time. So what it's doing is causing a poor quality of service to you because my my interaction with you is just to get the basic information, get done as quick as I can, so I can hurry and close that other call for service to lower that response time. So it creates a culture of we're not providing a quality service, we're providing a quick service, a rapid service that we try and do, but it's not really that quality service that we're looking for. And then once we start treating law enforcement differently on how we uh, how we interact with the public and how we actually perform our duties. My ultimate goal with the Sheriff's Department is you take the, the how, what we have right now, the deputies that you have right now. The current Sheriff just wants to hire a whole bunch of more deputies. I want to keep all those deputies the same and rather than hire one more deputy, I want to hire three community service officers that can go out and handle calls for service that doesn't take a deputy to respond to. So now you have a deputy that is sitting right there available so when that call for service comes out about a burglary in a house, they are immediately there because they're not over here doing this job. Like for instance, we, our policy in the Sheriff's Department has been the same for 125 years. If you call 911, a deputy sheriff will show up. If you call because your cat is in the tree and your cat won't come out, a deputy sheriff is really going to come out to your house and try and get that cat out of that tree. I don't believe that should happen. I really don't think it should happen. If you call, we'll try and send somebody out there. It'll be a community service officer. It's not going to be a deputy sheriff because we're going to be handling the crimes that are causing you the quality of life issues, the drug sales, the burglaries, the stolen vehicles. And when they're tied up on minute calls that we shouldn't really be involved in, then you really have an issue with personnel. And you say, yeah, I need more people, I need more people. But you don't need the expensive ones. Because a person can come out and take a, a it, say, a, a, we, we, you can never stop vehicle thefts. Someone's going to keep stealing cars. But a deputy doesn't have to come out to take that report. A community service officer can take it, can come out and check for fingerprints, come out and check for evidence, come out and take that report from you, and it's a third of the cost, and they do the exact same job. They still, You're still getting a quality service, and it's not taking a deputy out of the field that wants to make a difference, that wants to change how we've always done it. You'd, nails down a chalkboard is, well, that's the way we've always done it. And that drives me nuts. So are they intending to hire more CSO, community service nope. officers? Not right now. You see, that, that could be the issue. Why should a uh, police officer, if you say, go and get the cat out the tree when we got somebody beating the crap out of somebody on the other side? Because, because currently you have a sheriff that as soon as he admits something, that he can do something different, and he can save a whole lot of money, he's going to also have to admit he could have done it 10 years ago. And he doesn't want to do that. So he'll just keep demanding more money, and he'll keep playing the victim saying, I can't do my job because that nasty board of supervisor won't give us more money so we can hire more deputies. That's been his answer for 10 years, and I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get political, but I'm a very conservative, fiscally conservative person. I don't like paying taxes. If, if anybody in here you like paying taxes, I got a tax bill I can give you. Please pay it for me. I don't like paying taxes any more than anyone else does. So I don't want to keep using more of the money that I'm just taking from my own pocket. I want to save money. I want to do things different that don't cost as much. The person that's in there now has no no desire to change. That's what I have to offer. My question is, I live in the city of San Jacinto. Obviously, the laundry is going to be who sets the fee to the city? Because obviously the city only has so much of a budget for officers. But the county is saying, okay, you want three officers? This is what's going to cost you a year. Who's setting that fee? The Sheriff's Department does. And what would you do to change that so we could have more? Because when City of San Jose, we have maybe two or three officers on patrol at a time. It all go and if there's a domestic violence call, it ties them all up. Right. It, it all falls down to whether or not you're trying to save money. I've told you that the only way we try and save money 
is by getting rid of people. That's the current direction of the sheriff. He, and I, my wife and I were at a, uh, a meeting out in Temesco Valley, and the sheriff was actually giving a speech. And he said that basically the department is an airplane. This is the, an, the analogy that he's given. We're in an airplane, and he's just letting that airplane die. The problem with that is when it gets down too far, it crashes, and nobody's going to pick it up. So his answer is just to let all of our personnel leave, and that's how he wants to save money. The problem with, with how you come up with a contract rate, it's how you provide the service of those deputies. So the training of it, the, the, the equipment, the, the cost of maintaining all of those things that bring you a deputy sheriff, that's where the cost is. It's not the, the amount of deputies we have in the department. It's how we come about that deputy. So if we have no intention of saving money within the department, the contract rate is never going to go down. No, and our contract rate it goes up a certain percentage right. every single year. And we get that. Exactly. And right. throughout their generation in this valley, and I remember when the vote came down in the city of San Jacinto to vote for to bring county in and get rid of city services. And we were told that we would have more officers on duty at a time if we contracted with the county. So everybody voted for the county, and we still have the same amount of officers. Or less. Or less. Or less. Or less. It's, 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 and now, because once you contract with county, it's hard to go back to city because the cities don't have money to buy all the equipment again. Right. And, and, to, and to be very, very honest with you with contracting. Contracting, I'm not saying this because I'm a sheriff's department, I'm saying it because yeah. I know the cost of city budgets and I know the cost of police, city police departments and county. It's cheaper to contract. That's why everyone does it. It really is cheaper to contract. But, so you have to have... Officers too, and that didn't happen. You actually have to have someone with a desire to lower costs to provide you a cheaper contract rate so you can have more. The, the argument that, that the department is giving every time it's asked of, of the sheriff is it's the Board of Supervisors' fault because they gave raises to whatever. Well, I got a whole bunch of deputies standing around saying, I haven't had a raise in forever. So where is this, where is all these raises coming from? But they hired that consultant company. Yeah, that's a, the consultant company is not the sheriff's department. That was from the county. I know. If they had, here's my contention, my personal view of that auditing, who, who operates the biggest budget in the county. If they had a sheriff that was fiscally responsible, that was open about his books, that was open about how much money we spend and how much money we need, there would be no need for that auditing company. So, do you want to blame the Board of Supervisors or do you want to blame the sheriff for causing them to have to do that to find where they can save money? Because the sheriff wasn't doing it, so they had to bring in an outside agency for $40 million because they felt that the sheriff wasn't doing it. This is what I want to tell you about your Board of Supervisors. What you're told by the sheriff is that the Board of Supervisors don't care about public safety because they're not giving him any more money. Each of you vote for a Board of Supervisor. In, your, in the district here, it's Supervisor Washington. If Supervisor Washington came in here today and said, I'm running for election again, and I don't support public safety, I don't think we should have cops, and I don't think we should, we should be giving money to the police, are any of you going to vote for him? Nobody would vote for him. No matter what politician you are, whether you're Republican or whether you're Democrat, the number one priority of government is public safety number one priority and everyone knows it so what the sheriff wants you all to believe is you have five supervisors that are sitting up there down in the in supervising at, at the board of supervisors building none of them care about public safety because none of them will keep giving him more money this is what i want to pose to you take them all individually and then where's the common denominator all of them, you all, I'm telling you, they have to be for public safety. So, where's the negativity coming from? It's coming from the sheriff. So, where is the real problem? You've got five people pointing this finger at the sheriff, and you've got him saying, 
these people that want to be elected again aren't for public safety. That's just simply not true. Yes? I read that you were being punished for running from the police Your current status. I am a big waste of your taxpayer money. That is my current status. So after, if you all don't know, I ran in 2014. So after the two, that the day after the 2014 election, I lost. So at eight o'clock in the morning, the day after the election, I was sent down to sheriff's administration. I was walked downstairs. I was walked into an office that had a computer in it, a computer and a desk. That's it. And I sat there for 799 days, doing nothing. They gave me one bit of work because they had to justify me doing something. So my amount of work was, we have five jails, and each jail would send me a spreadsheet once a month, and I would cut and paste that spreadsheet into one spreadsheet and email that to someone else. So that was my job. That was a waste of taxpayers' money. It was a horrible waste of taxpayers' money. So then it gets better. So then the auditing company that they spent $40 million for found me there. And why do you have the, one of the most tenured lieutenants in your department sitting there doing nothing? And so immediately I was sent to him. The next day I was sent to him. That's not how transfers work in our department. You're told you're transferring and then it goes by pay periods. So you wait usually two weeks, sometimes more, for that to come about. I went the next day. I ended up in him. So then I worked for him for 10 months or so, and then the deputies association came to me and begged me to run again for sheriff because I had told people that I wasn't going to run again. Uh, my wife and I decided personally, with some health issues, we weren't going to do it again. But they came to me, they begged me, they kept begging me, they kept begging me. Then, if here's one thing about the, about cops. Don't ever tell a cop anything if you want to keep a secret, because it doesn't work. Tell a cop or tell a phone, that thing is getting out there like that. So as soon as the rumor started getting out that I was running for sheriff again, and that's all it was, was a rumor, I was assigned to Hemet. They stripped me of everything in Hemet. I have an office now that I sit there in an office all day long and I can't do anything. They told me I can't help anyone from the public. They told me under no circumstance can I help another deputy sheriff. I can't help an employee. So now I'm sitting there. Absolutely. So right now, I have in my office, I have another whiteboard. So up in my whiteboard, I have the amount of days that I've spent sequestered doing nothing and the amount of money that I've been paid to do nothing. Now, I do, I do, I'm, I'm management in our department. So I am one of the top people in our department. I'm supposed to be paid to run bureaus, to run stations, to to be very, very productive with employees. Instead, I'm not. So I'm about at a thousand, I don't remember the exact number, it's a thousand eighty days, something like that, where they've wasted me doing nothing, and I'm coming up on a half a million dollars over that four year period. So while the sheriff is complaining about personnel and about money. Is he really? Does he really care? Does he really care? This job to him, his job is nothing but a political tool for him to get elected. He's cried the victim for ten years. He's blamed it on everybody else. All of his woes are on somebody else. We've never done anything different or better to, to provide you with a quality service better than what we did the year before. It's just always give me more money so I can hire more people, so I can do the same thing I did last year. And next year, we'll have the same argument. And that's the position that we're in. Chad, how does it feel to be a million dollar paperweight at the office? It's not a million yet. <laughs> I better not make it for five more years. Okay. On the county side of Hammond, yes. we have a Hammond manager Yes. My understanding, there's really one deputy there. There's two. There's two deputies. Two deputies that work for sheriff. How can two deputies in that whole area by themselves? Can you put more in there? Uh, if you elect me. And when's that going to be? June 5th. <laughs> June 5th. Your best bet is to vote by mail. That's the easiest.
place, then you don't have to find out where you vote. So you contact the register of voters and you tell them that you want to vote by mail, so then they mail you your ballot, you fill it out and send it back in. Then you don't have to find out where the polling place is. Well, one thing, I, we had a situation, first of all, in my whole area of Belisha Ranch, my wife gets tired of getting knocked on the door because I evidently turned out to be cop on the block for the whole area. But I called San Francisco, we had an issue, and we'll get to it. I called the Highway Patrol Bureau of Investigation and spoke to an investigator. They came out with little cameras and saw what's up, and they broke up a auto theft. Now, I first presented that to the San Francisco Police Department, and they were going to get to it. When I called the Highway Patrol, I identified myself by credentials. They were out there the next day looking. They had it all staked out, and they caught those guys driving a BMW down the highway. They followed them from the house. So I want to depend on the sheriff's department who are we're paying, not the state. Then, then you should elect me. Because let me tell you how what is going on right now. I'm a perfect example of being assigned at this station. So I'm in management. I have a lot to manage. I mean, everything that goes on at that station, technically, I should be managing. However, that doesn't occupy my time all day long. I can get my work done and still have time to help someone. But yet I'm being told that I can't help someone. So I'm being told, while I'm sitting in that station, I'm being told that I can't even go to the front lobby when someone comes in to file a complaint or when someone has a crime that occurred and they need a report. I can't even help them. So. The reasoning is, if I artificially help someone and their problems are taken care of quickly, then the whole narrative of we need more people and we need more money goes away. It's 100% political. 100% political. At the taxpayer's expense. At the, well, not only the taxpayer's expense, but it's also at your deputy's expense. Because the safety of your deputies is also at stake. After your, after the safety of your deputies, that places you at risk because here's the reality. The deputies are by themselves. There's only two of them. So the instance of the, the deal where the, where the homicide happened here, they, there was a domestic violence call that was up in Idlewild. So they had to wait. One of them had to wait till the other one was available so they both could go because they're not going to go by themselves to that type of a call. So when their safety is placed at risk, they obviously want to go home to their families. So they're not going to be the Lone Ranger and run out there. Now, I will tell you that more than likely in a life and death situation where you're calling screaming for help, we are going to come and help you. But on a past call like that of a domestic violence where you really don't know what you're getting into, they had to go together. And so that's why that's why it left everybody in there alone. But it puts them at risk, which in turn puts you at risk. And it's all of these people at risk simply for the political season so someone can move on. Yes, ma'am. What are you going to do about I'm going to make all of them wear that shirt to school. <laughs> <laughs> she asked what I'm going to do for the to ensure the safety of the kids at school. And I told her I'm going to make them all wear that shirt. That's going to work. The, our schools... <clears throat> the, the school districts, I want to, I want to ensure all of you that your school districts do really care about your kids. And every one of the high schools has a school resource officer in it. And the school district is very, very generous with the money that they are putting forward to keep the law enforcement officers in school, even to the point where they're talking about increasing the numbers that are going out into the schools. So you're probably going to actually have more. And then the reality of the school resource officers is they all go around to different places when they, you know, if they learn of something, you're not just having your one at your school. You'll get four or five there that day if they know something's going to, going to happen. So the schools, I, I hope, 
it was a horrible tragedy that happened in Florida, and it makes the news all the time. And, and it's a, I mean, you, you hope that it, it never happens anything like that here. But I, I can't speak for them because I don't know what goes on there. I know our school resource officer program is quality, and we do actually care about you guys. So you guys are probably a whole lot safer than the rest of us out in public. So I don't want you to be worried about school. Did that answer your question, kind of? Kind of, not really. We, we are very concerned about the schools, and so is the schools. So we're always working to provide a better security and better safety for the schools. I just got one question. What can I do for you to help you get elected? You can tell 90,000 people to vote for me. I can do that. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, well, there's a couple things I want to ask, but when you decided to do the raids in Hansa, yes. um, 70 million, was in three months? Roughly. Three months for the raids. That sounds like a lot of money, but it's barely a dent. Oh, truly. Barely a dent. And because when you're in Hansa, everywhere else is doing that. What do you do about the um, state of California seeming to think, oh, this is okay? Because that's that's another battle, and how can you combat the will of the people in the state of California? I mean, I'm personally very glad you, you did that, but it's really a drop in the bucket. It is. And when you were doing that, there might have been local crimes affecting us directly, and so instead of fighting the state of California, we could have been keeping San Francisco safer. Does that make sense, the question I'm asking? Yes. I mean, it was a good decision, and it plays well with the public, like, yay. But I think we all know that that's a nothing for all. So that would be my question. When you make a decision like that, are you being pressured from the, the Board of Supervisors? Was that something you took out to do on your own? I did. I did that on my own because I had 150 residents all screaming the same thing, that their quality of life was being seriously impacted by crime and we weren't doing anything about it. Well, we all, everywhere, are being affected by and that. And that's, what, and that's what I told you. We can do a whole lot more than what we are currently doing for you. We have a lot of different resources. And the, the reality of crime is crime is not, there's not 100% of the population is not out doing crime. Probably percentage-wise, maybe 10%. 10% of crime is committed by 10% or crime is committed by 10% of the population. So it's not all over. So if you target the crime places, if you target the where you're having an issue, criminals will go where it's easy to commit crimes. So if they flourish where they're committing their crimes because nobody's going in and stopping them, then that's where you that's where now you feel don't safe you don't feel safe coming outside your home. And we weren't doing anything to change that. So that's what I was explaining about how we change the way we actually work by being proactive. Right now we're reactive and we're not going out and fighting that crime area. So if we were proactive, we would be taking a group of proactive people and finding that two or three people in your neighborhood that are really all the ones that are doing all the crime. And it really is that simple. It's not a hundred people out in your neighborhood that are committing crimes. It's maybe at the most ten. Well, how do you plan? They say all politics are local. If, you know, you don't run for an office that's got some power without having a loop. I mean, you're subject to being political yourself. So this is kind of a personal question, but how do you plan on staying apolitical, staying a conservative, and having a clear mind and not falling into the same BS that happens all the time. Now we're gonna, you're getting a little personal here. I know. I but know. here is my life. <coughs> my life is God, her, my kids, and then my job. And that's how she And as long as everything that I do, that I do is in that order, then it doesn't matter. I'm not involved in politics. And my job is law enforcement. My job is not, I don't want to be a politician. I want to be a law enforcement officer that provides the best quality service that I can to you. That's what I'm going to do. As soon as I become a politician, then you run the same boat that you have right now. Exactly. 
you have a politician in office. I want to be, I want to provide you with a service. I, my, I don't want to be the sheriff. I want to be in a position to provide you a better service. And it just so happens that the only way I get to be that is if you elect me sheriff. So it's just, it's like one of those things that has to happen in order to, for me to provide you a service. Well, thank you for sharing that because that, that would make me want to go to because those things do play into it. We have too many people in power that don't have any moral space or have a moral compass. Yeah. So my, my integrity means everything to me. Everything. And not so much, it's not, it doesn't mean, it's not because of my job, it's not because, I, it's a little bit even more personal, it's my kids. Because if, if I am now all of a sudden not going to, if I'm going to give away my integrity, because that's really the only thing that, that can't be taken away from you. No one can take away your integrity. You give that give up. You give it away. So if I make the decision to give away my integrity, then that just taught my kids, who I've beat it into them, that your word is everything and your integrity is everything. I've just taught them now that, uh, dad's a sellout, if dad did it, I can do it too. It'll never happen. Yeah. Right. Okay, another question. How do we approach the sheriff's office and demand open accounting? <laughs> Give him a little hint. No, I mean, it like, really? today. Today, I call him up and say, I want to look at the books, just like in the city of Hunter. You can do it. Because it's my They're going to be told no. To tell them, Absolutely. Right? And you, the answer is going to be no. They're, they'll give you the runaround, well, what do you want to see? And then they'll give, be very specific, and they'll make you be specific, and you'll only get that. And if you don't know exactly what to ask for, if you don't know exactly where you're going, they're going to steer you down into getting absolutely nothing. The, the way the Sheriff's Department works, where it's different than any other county department, the Board of Supervisors in every county department other than the DA and the Sheriff controls all of the money. How it works in our department is the Board of Supervisors controls how much money they give us, but they cannot control where that money's spent. That's strictly up to the Sheriff, and he doesn't have to tell anybody where it's spent. So do your job. Have integrity, character, work hard, go arrest bad guys like we hired you to, and we'll get along fine. And we did. And Within about a year, um, he ran a uh, sting on one of my partners. We didn't know it, but the guy was stealing meth and using meth off duty. Okay. He was swiping some off of, a little bit off of each arrest, and Chad ran this sting, arrested the guy, and said, hey, just do your jobs, go arrest bad guys. So from the inside, I can tell you, Chad isn't gonna, you know, oh, the good old way network at West worked for the Sheriff's Department, we're just gonna keep everything the same. And then he kept following me, following me to Reno Valley. <laughs> he needed close supervision. <laughs> he, he followed me to Reno Valley and um, you know he took over patrol as a lieutenant and they kept having issues with uh, you know the deputies were coming in at you know the three o'clock or the uh, five o'clock shift and the seven to five o'clock shift they couldn't close all the calls out so the guys that were coming in the evening when all the tweakers and bad guys were out breaking into cars and doing drug deals they were taking care of all the morning calls and he said well why are we doing this well we just don't have the manpower there's five or six ten pages of calls pending so we're going to just be reactive the whole time and he said you know let's adjust schedules to where we have guys coming in you know morning mid shift evening and graveyard with four shifts and get the calls cleared up so that me as a, a patrol deputy at the time I come in at you know 10 o'clock at night there's a couple calls and then we're out chasing bad guys and he followed, he followed me to traffic and did the same thing he got hey how come you guys aren't doing this well we don't have the right equipment he got us the right equipment so I can I just tell you from personal experience I would be concerned if I didn't know him is he gonna follow through with what he says he's gonna do and from personal experience I've known him for 16 years and he does yeah. I've always lived by if you if you ask a five-year-old child what it is cops do they'll give you an answer if you ask an adult hey what do cops do then you get the, you get the interview question where well you know we can work and we do this and oh it's this great thing if you ask a five-year-old or if you ask an 80-year-old what cops do they'll both give you the same answer they tell you they arrest the bad guys 
But somewhere in the middle, it gets all convoluted, and we think that we have to become politicians and we have to do all of the garbage. When it really comes down to arresting bad guys is providing public safety for you. That's what our job is. And if you don't ever forget that, then you will always be successful. That's and that's what I always told them. Yes, sir. The say is this: from what I've heard you say, you want young officers to become old officers. Officer safety, officer backup is what is needed. And it's not being done. I would hate, you know, I mourn every time a cop dies or gets hurt. And you know, you don't know what it's like, you know, personally, having been with four guys that attacked by 25 guys and you can't get a backup. You know, that concerns me. And I'm sure with what you're saying, you're going to see that that doesn't happen. And that is my word. The young guys coming on, I'd like to see them. Because I had a friend that I went to school with who joined LAPD. And he went to work at the academy. He went to brief him. He got out the first call. Fifteen minutes after he walked up to his first call, he was shot in the head. That kind of thing. You know. But, you know, that's out in different jurisdictions. But it's better here, and I'd like to also say, well, that will also promote safety to the community. That's One what I want. Other. That's exactly where you can say, hey, George, Cheryl, sure. hey, look, this is going on. You know, yes. And get it taken care of. One way or the other. You know, who wants to have to call the feds and highway control to do something that's a community problem? Right. That we're supposed to be taking care of. First. Exactly. Take care of home first. I've been watching um, Facebook posts, and we've heard um, or I've read about you know scandals that are coming out of the sheriff's department, and it seems to me like it's from poor management and poor leadership, like cheating scandals and like. You know, uh, like officer involved, you know, corruption and things like that kind of being swept under the rug. Do you have a plan to clean up those kinds of cultural problems within the sheriff department? Yes, and it's it's you have to you have to lead by example. So if you're not if you're providing an example and that's the example you're setting, then that's what you get. Right. So if the cheating scandal was a horrible thing. And th th let me tell you how that really thing. Uh, that was a big. That was a big deal. It was a big deal, and it was bigger than what you really think. But because there's People politics involved, promoted and are still getting promoted. Because it was covered up. Because it was swept under the rug. It was all kept quiet, and they were allowed to keep their jobs, so we didn't have to fire. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 people. So by allowing them to keep their jobs, you basically created a culture of, it's all right, and, and then you still get promoted out of it. So where was the consequence? And where that really came to a head, and there were as many of us saying this way back when, if you aren't going to fire them, you're telling everybody it's okay. So you're just going to cause the next promotion process to do the same thing. And it happened. And it, but that time it was with lieutenants. So unless somebody at the top puts their foot down and, I mean, do, nobody wants to be made the example. So all you got to do is make one person an example and everybody else all of a sudden you say, no, there's integrity at the top and we better not do this. So it's, the, the, the issue that I want to tell all of you, and you will probably vouch for me as, as, a, as a retired cop, is good cops don't like bad cops because bad cops give us all a bad name. So when I walk out into public in my uniform, nobody really sees Chad Bianco, they see the uniform. Well, if they were treated poorly by a uniform six months ago, they don't know that there's any difference. It might as well have been me that did it, even though it wasn't, because all they see is that bad cop. So all of us know that bad cops have got to go. And we have to police ourselves, because sometimes nobody, I mean, nobody else is doing it if we're not. So if we set that culture that you better do everything right, and if you don't, you're going to get punished for it, then it doesn't happen. I mean, it's like your kid. If you let your kid yeah. get away with everything, I didn't do it.
pushed you to the side, kind of black you. Whatever it takes. That to me is, man, when you don't fit in, that's the best. You fit in. In this department, because I don't keep my mouth shut. If I see something that is wrong or something should be fixed, I voice my concern about that. And being told that no one will ever tell me that's the way we've always done it. Just don't worry about it. That's the way we've always done it. And I never in my career have been that person that just goes with the flow. I'm not a go with the flow guy. So if I can make a difference and I can make other people do a make a difference, I'm going to do it. And that's really why ultimately I got pushed aside because he knows it. And he's afraid of me being out in public. And so that's why that's why he's buried. So where are you at on social media? Twitter, Facebook? Yes, yes, oh, yes. Okay. Oh, All of that. Okay. The, my Facebook page is Chad Bianco for Sheriff 2018. I also have my own, Chad Bianco, but if you if you want I don't want to say smart-ass comments, but sometimes on my personal page, I might say a little bit something more snide than I will on my campaign page. So you can follow both of them, and you're fine. And then I also, on that on that pamphlet, there's also a, web, a website. So you can find information at the website and both of my Facebook pages. Sorry, sorry. No, you didn't. But if you talked about how your the officers and personnel are leaving because they do not like the Riverside County Sheriff's. What's your plan to attract them back if they're leaving at another system? They know that once I change the culture, it's really the Sheriff's Department is a better department to work for than a police department because we have a lot more opportunity. There's more opportunity for advancement. We have more special teams. We have more fun things that you can, you know, extra things other than just patrol. So if they all know what I'm going to do, and then as soon as I do it, then the word of mouth is going to spread that, hey, all of our woes are gone. It's all, this is a great department. And we all talk. I mean, we deputies talk with police officers, and it, word gets around. So once they find that, if they're not happy where they are, if it was, if they really like the sheriff's department better, what it could have been, then they could come back. And really, lateral in between agencies isn't really that difficult. So it won't be. Uh, it won't be very hard to get them back. Because ultimately, a lot of people just want to be a sheriff. They've always wanted to be a sheriff. And they're making a concession to go through the police department just to try and like their job. So I'll be able to bring them. Any of you are multi-multi-millionaires, you can adopt me. <laughs> and we, you, can, you can fund this campaign for your son. If you're not, the our only other option is whether or not we're going to reach enough voters to win this election. And that can be done by word of mouth. So if you tell every single person that you know and that you come into contact with that we need a change, that we need something better, and we need to provide something for the Sheriff's Department so they can provide something better to us and get them to vote for me in June, that's how we're going to make sure we win. It's really mathematical. All we have to do is tell everybody to vote.